and particularly the verses from Isaiah, um, which are, are very, very special about the fact that whoever we are, whatever's wrong with us, it's not to do with our circumstances. It's to do with our hope in Jesus. It's to do with his spirit living within us. He can do immeasurably more than we can ever understand or imagine. And so, in a sense, we need to come to really know him. And if you don't know him tonight, I just want to share a few verses from Matthew about us being salt and light as his people. But also for people who don't yet know him, you can trust him. He is the most awesome God. I've proved it since I was 14. And when I've been through like breast cancer, stuff like that, immediately afterwards, and some people may know this, 10 days afterwards, I went to Unite and I actually shared my experience with, over to, there was about 200 young people there that night. And when my husband died just a couple of years ago, God kept putting me across people's path who had also been widowed. And one meeting I went to, this lady came and wanted to share. And that's what it's all about, being his hands and his feet and showing love. So just want to read these few verses, very familiar verses from Matthew 5. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Influencing our world for Jesus, how can we do that? I want to share a story with you first before we go on to uh, perhaps a bit of a spiritual examination, as it were. Dr. Evan Kane was the chief surgeon of Kane Summit Hospital in New York. He had practiced his speciality for 37 years. Over the course of time, he came to question the wisdom of using general anesthetic for every surgery. He believed people would recover quicker if they only had local anesthetic. However, no matter how convinced Dr. Kane was, about his theory, he had one problem. Nobody wanted to go under his knife while they were still awake. Everyone talked uh, to the, about the same fear that they would have. They didn't want to feel the pain of the scalpel while they were awake during the surgery. After much searching, Kane finally found a willing subject. It helped that it was a relatively common procedure. According to Kane's own records, during his practice, he had performed around 4,000 appendicectomies. So the procedure was almost second to none. The patient was prepped and brought into the operating room. The local anesthesia was carefully administered. And, as he had always done, he cut into the right side of the abdomen and entered the body cavity and tied off the blood vessels, found the appendix, excised it, and finished by sewing up the incision back. To his own credit, he proved himself right. Throughout the surgery, the patient felt very little discomfort. In fact, he was up and around the next afternoon, which was remarkable since this was back in 1921. Back then, when people had appendicectomies, they were kept in hospital for six to eight days. It was a milestone in the world of medicine. However, what made it particularly noteworthy was that the patient and the doctor were the same person. Dr. Kane operated 
on himself. Now, believe it or not, I'm not going to ask you today to, you know, I'm not going to have squeamish things, and we're not going to have blood. My son doesn't, that can't stand blood. Don't worry, we won't even break the skin. But what I want to do is spiritually exploratory surgery. I want you to root around a bit within your soul, as it were, and take a hard and honest look at your spiritual health. And don't worry, I'm doing it as well. And to see if your faith is as healthy as it should be. Our text for today is Matthew 5, 13 to 16. And these, of course, are verses fairly near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. In this message, Jesus calls his followers to the highest standards of conduct. He challenges us to turn the other cheek when we are struck on the right one. He commands us to love our enemies, to forgive people who do wrong, who do us wrong, and to be sure we act with the purest motives. He said there were two roads, a wide road that leads to destruction and a narrow road that leads to life. And he said we ought to choose the narrow, however hard that path is to follow. And here in these verses, he calls those who follow him to choose to be a godly influence on society in which we live. Because as our brother shared, we could be in the end times. Nobody knows, only God, not even the Son. Now, I know that they're hard to do. They're very tough teachings. Because we're challenged, don't worry about anything. Well, I'm sure there are things that we all are concerned about and probably do feel, uh, you know, what can we do? But we know we should give it to God. We don't always do that first. And then it's about storing up treasure in heaven and having lots of stuff. Do we really need that? These are tough commands, but you know, when it gets to that last bit, it didn't seem to be quite as hard, but you know, it really is. Jesus expects us to be salt and light, to help to change the world by his Holy Spirit through his power with our actions. He doesn't just expect us to exist in the world. He expects the world to be transformed by our presence. The more I pondered on these two images he used to describe how we are to affect the world, the more I recognize how tough these words are. The first thing Jesus says is to, we are to be like salt. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Now at first, this can be a little difficult to understand, but he's not talking about the salt in our salt cellars. He's talking about salt that was gathered from the sea, which would be impure. Ours would only be impure if somebody played a trick on us, wouldn't it? But our salt is sodium chloride and it doesn't go bad. But in Jesus' day, as they got the salt from the evaporated seawater, it was never completely pure. And occasionally when they seasoned the meat, and did various other things, they realized it wasn't very salty at all and they'd throw it out. They'd throw it out onto the fields, maybe to fertilize the fields or something like that. What Jesus says in these verses is that if we as his followers are going to change the world we live in, we have to be the real thing. We have to be authentic. We have to be pure through the righteousness that Jesus gives us when we accept him. And so there's two words I want us to remember tonight, and that is be authentic, be real. I don't mean we say we're perfect, none of us are perfect, but be real, be authentic. 
But one thing that has limited the influences of Christians in the world, that many claim to follow Jesus aren't authentic. Maybe people have said, yes, oh yes, I will follow him, I believe in Jesus. But Jesus Jesus hasn't transformed them. They haven't actually given themselves to him completely. It may have been lip service. It may have been something like that. But Jesus wants us to follow him. He wants to change us to be that new creation which we are in him. When anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. If we are to influence the world, it's one that draws others to him by reality. People sometimes say, come to church maybe, and then the rest of the week, their lives do not reflect what Jesus would want of them. People want the real deal. If they don't get the real deal, I mean, they can watch so much on TV, imaginary stuff all of the time. But if Christians are the real deal, then the world will be changed by his people, by the Lord's people. So how authentic is your faith? Are the people drawn to your life, to faith by your life? If you are Christian, Do people who cross your path recognise that there is a difference in the way you live? In Galatians 5, Paul said that when the Holy Spirit is active in your life, you will be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. Do the people who you work with or your family members, or the people you go to school with, or the people who are around you, your neighbours, do they see the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life? Or is there so much not fake? Nobody likes a phony, and if you think you're fooling everybody, the only person you probably fool is yourself. The world can tell that miles away. And if you want to make people think you never struggle, that sin is only a distant memory in your life, then you aren't authentic. You are just wearing a mask. In ancient Greek, they had great theatrical events, plays in large amphitheatres, and they didn't have microphones to make their voices heard They didn't have cameras to magnify their images on the screen. So they invented their own system. They they developed masks, big masks, and the masks made them look like the characters they portrayed. Built into the masks were megaphones to amplify their voices. And the actors got on stage, got behind their masks, and they became somebody completely different than they really were. And of course, as we know, they were called hypocrites. That's where the word came from. And there are a lot of people who, for whom life is a big act. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 25 to 28, when he was talking to the religious teachers of the day? Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You see, God wants to change us, not superficially. God doesn't want just to change the way we look. He wants to change the way we are. He wants to clean us up from the very core of our being. 
And when we try to put on a mask, we short-circuit his work because we try to appear changed. But it's not real. Jesus calls us to influence the world towards godliness. To do it, we have to be authentic. We have to have faith in him that changes us from the inside out. Anything less won't do. The second image that Jesus uses, he uses to speak of, is no less challenging. Jesus compares us to light. And that's in verses 14 to 16. Now this image of life is a common one in the New Testament. John wrote about it in John 1. In him was life, and that light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not understand it. In 1 John 1 we read, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Consistently through the Bible, the thought is that where God is, there is light. Where God is not, there is darkness. Now what Jesus does in these verses is to expand the image of those who follow Christ. As believers in Christ, we become the light of the world. It is not that we have any ability of our own to bring light to the darkness. He simply means that by being followers of Christ, we gain the ability to reflect the light. That's why the result isn't that we gain the glory, but that God gets the glory for the good deeds that we do. However, the big point of what Jesus is saying comes in verses 14 and 15. Light exists for a purpose, to illuminate darkness. You can't hide light and it be any good. You have to share it. And it seems to me that Jesus is saying that as light, Christians need to be available. Being available is just as important as being authentic if we're going to influence the world for Christ. Jesus is challenging us to make a concerted effort to live in contact with people past who don't know Jesus' love and the hope that he offers. When you are blessed enough to live in the light, make sure you don't hide it. Be available enough to reflect it to others who are still living in the darkness. That's the only way you will ever influence them. How might that be? Well, through volunteering. To go somewhere and get involved, whatever it is, like the coffee bar here or tea and toast, like, you know, various things that outreach work that we do in our fellowship. Or go to places where you wouldn't expect to go. Just go and be salt and light. Get involved. Smile when you get to the checkout, even though you're absolutely furious that there's a long queue. Help somebody who needs assistance. The chances are better that you will be able to influence people for Christ when they can see that Christ has made a difference in your life. A man called Joe Aldrich said, Christians are to be the good news before they share the good news. This sounds all very well, and how do we get the balance between being authentic, where maybe we sort of read lots of Christian books and absorb ourselves in the teaching, great, and prayer. But then we don't meet anybody to influence them. And how about when we're available? But how about when we're available and we do lots and lots of things socially, we go out and about. We don't be with Jesus first 
So when people talk about the entertainment or the things they do, we're just the same as them. We're no different. So we need to have both. We need to be with Jesus so we can go out with the good news to him, with him. So if we look at ourselves, we can see whether we're sort of on one side or the other side. But the Lord wants us to know him, to love him, to mature in him and his word. But he also wants us to be in the world, to be in the world, but not of the world. That's what he asks us to be. So it's quite tough, isn't it, to be salt and light. But authentic faith in the world and availability, either way, we can be. That's in both those instances, we can be salt and light. I want to tell you something to finish and then to sum up. There was a business owner who became interested in Christianity, but he maintained a distance and just observed for a while. He employed many Christians in his company and he watched them like a hawk. He said, you know, I was naturally drawn to God by observing Christian workers who were conscientious and kind and thorough. But I'll tell you what really impressed me. One day, a lad whom I knew to be a fresh convert asked if he could see me after work. I agreed to meet him. And later on that day, I started to worry in case this young religious zealot might actually come and try and convert me. I was surprised when he came into my office with, with his head hanging low and said to me, Sir, it'll only take a few minutes, but I'm here to ask for your forgiveness. Over the years I've worked for you, I've done what a lot of employees do, like borrowing a few company products here and there, I've taken some extra supplies, I've abused telephone privileges, and I've cheated the time clock now and then. He went on, but I became a Christian a few months ago, and it's the real thing. In gratitude for what Christ has done, and in obedience to him, I want to make amends to you and the company for the wrongs I have done. So could we find out a way to do that? If you have to sack me for what I've done, I understand I deserve it. Or if you want to dock my pay, then dock my pay, whatever figure is appropriate. If you want to give some extra work, I'll do it in my own time. That'll be okay too. I just may want to make it right between God and us. In the end, they worked out that the business owner said that one of the, that conversation made a deeper spiritual impact on him than anything else ever had. That employer, employee didn't influence the boss because he had clever presentation of the gospel. He did it because he was living out of faith that was both authentic and available. You know, we can do that too. Jesus said that we should, but to do it, we have to be willing to be the good news before we tell the good news. What about you? Are you bogged down with circumstances and feel you've been given a bad deal in life? Or are you, as Nick said, trusting in God, even though your circumstances haven't changed? Freedom is such an amazing, precious thing. It's the best, it's limitless. We have that hope in Isaiah 40, and I'd just like to read these few verses from Isaiah. I'd like to read verses 27 to 31. This, of course, was spoken to the people who were going to go into captivity, and we know that psalm by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, we remembered Zion. 
And this is what the Lord says. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fail. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. God is aware of what happens to us. God knows all about us. He hasn't forgotten us. God is able. He doesn't grow tired and weary. In fact, he doesn't lack any strength. He gives us and supplies the strength. And lastly, God is available. But we have to actively wait on him, not passively. Actively wait on him with an obedient trust. And he will help us to rise up on wings as eagles, to run and not be weary, and to walk and not faint. It's limitless, this Christian life. If you haven't really had the real deal, Jesus can give it you tonight. Tomorrow may not come. Things happen very quickly in life. My son had metacoccal meningitis swept over him very suddenly. He actually did recover, but he could easily not have done. It was a miracle. None of us know what tomorrow will bring. Dear people that we know can die in a flash. It's happened in our church. Didn't expect it. No signs of it. Are you ready? Are you there? Do you know where you'll go? If you don't, then please ask tonight. Tonight could be the start of your limitless and free life in Jesus. He's real. Let us be real, those who know him. And let's, let's really be the good news. I don't mean preaching at people, loving people, sharing his love, building up relationships with people. That's what it's all about. And then, with gentleness and respect, explaining the good news, being the good news, telling the good news. Amen.